Day 138 of the war in Gaza, while the Hamas Khan Yunus Brigade has now been defeated. There is still much work to be done in and around the former terrorist stronghold. There are also signs of growing protests against Hamas from the Gazan people. More on this from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. The organized Hamas brigade in Khan Yunus now no longer exists as an organized fighting force. Much effort is focused now on gathering Hamas weapons left behind by fleeing or surrendering gunmen. The IDF released footage showing a cache of weapons found by the paratroopers brigade in a building adjacent to a United Nations school. Some 60 operatives who hid at the school among Palestinian civilians were taken prisoner. According to the IDF, Hamas operatives would hide in the UN school, which was used as a shelter for Palestinian civilians. They would then sneak into a nearby building via a hole in the wall to attack Israeli troops. The paratroopers also raided the home of the head of the Khan Yunus Brigade's anti-tank unit and seized weapons and intelligence materials. The brigade is working to facilitate the evacuation of Palestinian civilians from their areas of operations in Khan Yunus and Rafa further south. Residents of Jabalia in the northern Gaza Strip and Rafa in the south took to the streets to protest against Hamas leaders. Since the start of the conflict, there have been several protests by Gazan residents who condemn Hamas for bringing the war and abandoning the people. In footage circulated on Palestinian social media, residents call out against Hamas leaders in Gaza, Yehia Sinwar, and against the organization's political bureau chief, Ismail Haniya who continues to live in luxury in Qatar. Israel is determined to move on the city of Rafa, but the last major Hamas stronghold is temporary home to some 1.3 million Palestinians displaced from elsewhere in Gaza. The IDF plans to give the civilians passage to safe areas before the offensive begins. And Hamas sexual violence during the October 7th rampage was both systematic and deliberate and continues on hostages in captivity. Those are the findings published today by the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel. Sexual violence was committed on a wide scale during the October 7th massacre, and these crimes continue against hostages held in Gaza. According to an extensive report released today by the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel, there were multiple attackers. Sexual assaults were carried out in front of victims' relatives and amid murders and included uniquely sadistic practices. According to the report, there were instances of rape and sexual violence carried out in four areas. During onslaught against the Nova Festival, on the communities close to the Gaza border, on military bases, and attacks ongoing against the hostages held in Gaza captivity. The report details rape committed while the victims were threatened with weapons, with multiple instances of gang rape of victims. The report says women, girls, and men were all targeted for sexual assault. In most cases, the victims were murdered after or even during the rape. The document was compiled by researchers who analyzed both confidential and public information, including the testimonies of eyewitnesses. The association says it will submit the report of what it called the sadistic sex crimes of Hamas to the United Nations for action. And joining us now with more on the report highlighting the accounts of premeditated mass rape of Jewish and Israeli women by Hamas on October 7th is Orit Sulitziano, Executive Director of the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So a very difficult uh, report, very difficult to read, but so important to give voice to the victims of sexual assault, most of who were brutally murdered and can't be a voice for themselves. Uh, so. What are the most significant findings of this report? We already got news at the 8th and the 9th of October about survivors and victims of this horrific massacre. We already knew from the beginning, from reliable sources, not, not social media, that this horrific atrocities indeed happened. As an organization that every day wants to break the code of silence on the issue of sexual assault in Israel, we understood that we have a big role here and we decided that we'll, to, we'll start to document and collect all of the, the information that the, the, that, that exists. And we decided that we were going to analyze this data in two uh, aspects. One, where did the things happen? And second, what happened? 
What did they do? The purpose is to see to see a picture. And we didn't know what we were going to find in the beginning, but the more we categorized all the information we had, we understood that in all of the different uh, scenes, the terrorist scenes, the crime scenes, in all of these places, the same practices happened again and again and again. Uh, I don't want to go into graphic details because a human being cannot, you know, it's too hard to digest, but I'll maybe just say that the Hamas brutally, sadistically, and repeatedly and intentionally did the same horrific things to women, shot them, shot them in, the, in their private organs, shot them in the face. Uh, and did other horrific things. It, it seems that they all had rules. They all had uh, instructions what to do. And as good soldiers, they did it. And we see in all of these uh, terrorist scenes, the same things happened again and again to many women. And so who is this report intended for? You know, as head of an organization that deals with rape, how do you explain uh, the silence from other women's rights organizations around the world? This report was already sent in the end of last week to the UN representative on sexual violence and conflict, Pramila Preton, which came to Israel and I met with her staff uh, last week. They spent her, I think, almost uh, two weeks. And uh, I gave them all the information we have as uh, the Association of Rape Crisis Centers that we can give them about what happened, about the fact that there are survivors in Israel. I want to say some women survived this massacre. So the report was, first of all, intended to the UN bodies and to international bodies who want to understand what happened. But uh, also, you know, um, uh, uh, you ask about this uh, silence. Uh, you know, it's very easy to write things on social media and say whatever you want. We are, as a country and as, as women in the country, face the most horrific things women can ever face. We have we have the uh, ob obligation to speak for them. Who will speak for these rape bodies that we saw? Who? And I think as a, a woman, as a feminist, for many years I'm active in, in trying to combat sexual violence. I think this is our obligation. We're an NGO. I want to say we do not get money from the Israeli government. We are only obliged to our survivors and to victims of sexual violence. This is why we exist, and this is why we fight, and this is why we speak. And this, and this is what, why we did this report. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, so, so this ordeal is not over because there are still female hostages being held by Hamas. What did the report find on what's happening to them even as we speak? Okay, I want to say one thing which was a very ethical, and this is part of our ideology. We purposely, purposely did not, not try to uh, take a, a question survivors, like hostages. Uh, we have information about survivors, but, but we did not want to. Why? Because you know, as a journalist, that many of the journalists today are trying to collect this information, how intrusive it can be, harmful. We want to be ethical. Uh, and the same goes for the hostages. The hostages said a lot, you know, uh, and there's a lot of information already that we heard it pri privately and publicly. So ev every information that we had, we collected it and analyzed it. And you are correct. This is this is horrible. But uh, the Hamas terrorists are in the all of these tunnels can do whatever they want. You know, they did in the Israel the most brutal things that a humankind can think about, and they can they can they're continuing to do these things. Uh, violently abusing, hurting, and doing horrific things. I don't want to even talk about it. And, and I don't know, I do not know how the world, I do not know how you and women, you and women that from money of the world, they exist. Why are they silent? You know, the answer is very easy. Politics. The head of you and women is from Jordanian origin. She is, she wants to be loyal to her people and she's betraying women. This is the result. All right, Orit Soliziano, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today about such an important issue. Thank you.
Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. And the United States on Tuesday vetoed a draft of a United Nations Security Council resolution on the war in Gaza, blocking a demand for an immediate ceasefire. This marks the third time the U.S. has used its veto power since the start of the war. All the details in the following report. The result of the voting is as follows. 13 votes in favor, one vote against, one abstention. The United States on Tuesday used its veto power to block a UN Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The Algerian drafted resolution did not link a ceasefire with the release of the hostages. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield said the U.S. vetoed the draft resolution as it failed to condemn Hamas or recognize Israel's right to self-defense, and said it would jeopardize talks between the U.S., Egypt, and Qatar, which seek to broker a temporary six-week pause in fighting in exchange for the release of all hostages held by Hamas. Demanding an immediate, unconditional ceasefire without an agreement requiring Hamas to release the hostages will not bring about a durable peace. Instead, it could extend the fighting between Hamas and Israel, extend the hostages' time in captivity, an experience described by former hostages as hell, and extend the dire humanitarian crisis Palestinians are facing in Gaza. Israeli ambassador to the UN Gilad Erdan also addressed the council criticizing the draft resolution. If Hamas survives, it will be our children that Hamas will murder in cold blood again. Israel seeks a ceasefire, but there is only one formula that we are willing to accept. All of our hostages must be released and Hamas must turn themselves in. Colleagues, the Algerian resolution not only empowers jihadists by calling for a ceasefire, it also fails, again, to condemn Hamas for their heinous crimes. The United States now aims to propose a rival draft resolution calling for a temporary ceasefire in exchange for the release of hostages and opposing an Israeli military operation in Rafah. And U.S. Middle East envoy Brett McGurk is due in Cairo and is expected to present new ideas to jumpstart stalled talks for the release of Israeli hostages held in Hamas captivity. More from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. U.S. Special Envoy Brett McGurk joins Qatari and Egyptian mediators where he is reportedly suggesting a temporary halt in Gaza fighting that would begin before and last throughout Ramadan, beginning on or about March 10th. In exchange, according to the report, the plan would see Hamas free some hostages held in Gaza, including six Americans. Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh is attending the Cairo meeting, but there is no indication that the terrorist leadership is ready for anything less than a permanent end to the war and a withdrawal of IDF forces from Gaza. Israel did not send an official representative to Cairo to protest what Prime Minister Netanyahu calls Hamas's delusional demand that Israel end the war. Yes. Qatar confirmed that its efforts at mediation are ongoing. Qatar 
Qatar also announced that it has received confirmation from Hamas that the terror group received the medications for Israeli hostages in Gaza and has begun delivering them to the Israeli captives. The transfer of medication took place last month when Qatar, together with France, brokered an agreement between Israel and Hamas to deliver medication to specific hostages in need, as well as medical supplies for Gazan civilians. Since the announcement, there has been no confirmation that the hostages received the medications. And Syria's state-run Sana News Agency reported on Wednesday of an alleged Israeli airstrike in the Kfal Susa neighborhood of Damascus, in which at least two people were killed. Footage from the scene shows a precision strike on an apartment building, with Sky News Arabic reporting that the alleged targets of the strike were Iranian nationals. This is the same district that was targeted in an Israeli attack in February 2023 that killed Iranian military experts. And moving on, my next guest has a truly remarkable and terrifying story to share. She discovered that she's a target of an Iranian assassination attempt. Saskia Pantel, a Swedish Zionist activist, joins us now in the studio. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so first of all, I mean, what can you tell us uh, about this sort of assassination plot? Um, how did you find out about it? I know that when you first found out about it, you thought it was, was a, a prank or a joke. I mean, so what can you tell us? Well, it was extremely surreal. Uh, I got a phone call one day here in Israel. Um, somebody saying they were calling from the Swedish uh, security services, SAPO, and that I was the target of a assassination terror plot by the Iranian state to kill three Swedish Jewish citizens. So, And, and so, you know, what, what made you specifically a target? I mean, you, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, the work that you're doing and why Iran would, would specifically target you. Sure. Um, well, I've been very active in the Zionist world and Zionist Federation. Uh, for many years, I started as the vice president, became the president of the Zionist Federation nationally in Sweden. So I used to hold a lot of rallies for Israel and against anti-Semitism. And I saw myself as, as working for, for good. And I felt that I was protected in a country, especially a country like Sweden. So I believe that I became a target because I was using my voice and speaking up against hate. And has the threat been neutralized? I mean, what can you tell us about that? So um, they arrested two people who pretended to be Afghani refugees, and they came with the refugee wave back in 2015. It was later discovered that Swedish authorities had been warned. Uh, one of them was flagged twice before getting asylum, that he was not Afghani, but actually connected to the Iranian regime, which it later turned out to be. Um, they were thankfully arrested prior to even moving forward with the terror plans, but Sweden did not manage to convict them. They were deported, they were released back to Iran. And all of this came up also thanks to Swedish um, radio who did an investigative um, piece, linking this also to the Iranian embassy in Stockholm. And this is where I'm not sure about the threat being eliminated because, okay, two agents were sent back to Iran, but if they're working with the embassy and the embassy is part of doing es espionage on Swedish territory against Swedish citizens, there's a huge problem. Absolutely. I mean, and so is Sweden doing anything now to, to investigate, to, you know, to, to make sure that this threat has been eliminated? Um, their response to all of this is that they consider the threat gone because these two people are deported. I don't believe that that's the case because if Sweden doesn't do something thorough about this, uh, start off by cutting the diplomatic ties with Iran. Why have an embassy that's also linked to terror plan to Swedish citizens? Um, they need to take further measures. They have been questioned in regards to how they handle the asylum for these two people. And they basically just stated that um, it's, it's passed, it worked out for the better that they were caught, but that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. And have you, have you been back to Sweden mm -hmm. since you've discovered of this uh, assassination attempt? 
Yes, um, I did go back three weeks into the war here in Israel uh, with uh, my baby girl and my family. It's, it's different being in Israel during a war now as a mother, but I only stayed for two weeks and it was a very hard decision because I felt I should not have to fear um, for my, my child's safety um, from sirens and, and being under missile attacks here in Israel from also Iran, being behind Hamas or Hezbollah, or going to Sweden, where I'm also threatened by Iran, but on an individual level. So it's, it shouldn't be that. If you're a Swedish citizen, you should feel like you can go back to Sweden and have be protected. And I mean, so from what I'm hearing, you, you still have a concern for your life should you leave Israel, should you travel abroad. I mean, here in Israel, do you feel safe? Yes, only in Israel. Only in Israel. And back in Sweden, you, you de didn't feel uh, safe. You, you were still concerned for... for I didn't feel safe, but also prior to this happening, I've had so many death threats over at least a decade's amount of time for being an activist. And I tried to get hidden identity for 10 years in Sweden, and they just kept telling me they only do so if there's an actual threat. Now there is a threat, but and they say it's gone, but it's... It doesn't feel that way. And at the end of the day, it's, it's also not about me. It's about every Swedish citizen. Sweden let these people in and it endangers Swedish citizens regardless if they were born in Iran originally and came as political refugees uh, fleeing from the Ayatollah and the regime. Or if they, like me, um, I was born in America. I'm an American citizen also. And I came to Sweden and thought I could live there safely. but turned out not to be the case. So an unfortunate situation in Sweden. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. And moving on, October 7th shattered many misconceptions, not only for Israelis, but for Jewish communities around the world, which are today facing unprecedented levels of anti-Semitism. This is especially true when it comes to Jewish college students and young adults. And as such, Birthright Israel has recently resumed its trips, bringing hundreds of Jewish youth to Israel to witness the atrocities of October 7th for themselves. Let's take a look. Birthright Israel resumed its 10-day Israel experience trips in mid-January and has brought hundreds of Jewish college students and young adults from around the world to Israel during the past month alone. In the midst of the war, all with the aim of fostering a deeper connection to Israel and to the Jewish people and additionally providing students and young adults with the knowledge, insights, and tools to combat anti-Semitism and the delegitimization of Israel. Birthright Israel is known for providing free Israel experience trips to Jewish youth. After October 7th, the organization put its trips to Israel on hold but resumed them in January to increase demand. The current experiences includes all the highlights of traditional visits, including trips to Masada, the Western Wall, the Dead Sea, Yad Vashem, Tel Aviv's Carmel Market, and more. But now, they also include opportunities for participants to bear witness to the atrocities of October 7th, visiting Hostages Square and meeting with victims and families of the hostages, as well as volunteering opportunities. Gidi Malk, the CEO of Birthright Israel, said upon announcing the resumption of trips in January that alongside a fun and meaningful experience, we want our participants to understand what happened on October 7th and gain meaningful insight on how the events affected Israeli society and Jewish communities around the world and how our Jewish lives, values and community help us find hope in these dark times. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected around the country tonight with lows of around 9 degrees Celsius or 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow we'll see the sun come out alongside steady top temperatures of highs of about 16 degrees Celsius or 62 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channel, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Ladar Gravelazi. Be well, stay safe, and thank you so much for watching.